In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, it is part two of my Big Board 1.0. In the last episode, I gave you my prospects 21 through 30, but I guess I did it in reverse order. It was 30 through 21. In this episode, find out the players that I believe should be selected in the middle of the first round in the 2024 NBA Draft. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. All right, let's get started. All right, in the last episode, I gave you picks 30, not picks, I keep saying picks. I gave you prospects 30 through 21. And I will revisit those prospects now. At number 30, I had Alexander Saar. At number 29, I had Adem Bona from UCLA. At number 28, I had French prospect Tijan Salon. At number 27, I had Oregon transfer and now Indiana big man Kalel Ware. At number 26, I have Iowa State freshman Omaha Ballou. At 25, I have Florida State sophomore Baba Miller. 24, Arkansas junior, he, I, he could still be a sophomore if he uses the red shirt year because he only played nine games. But I have Trevon Brazil from Arkansas. Then at number 23, I have Bobby Clintman who will be playing in the NBL this year. At 22, I have Marquez Oso Igodaro. And at 21, I have Duke sophomore, and one of the favorites for player of the year. Now he's gonna have an uphill battle to beat out Zach Eady, but I have Kyle Filipowski, who a lot of people think would have been a first round pick if he stayed in the 2023 NBA draft, elected to come back to school. I wonder how much did the hip surgeries play a part in him deciding to return to school, but I think he's due for a big year and he could be one of the guys that ends up proving me wrong. But at number 20, I have a player that is at Filipowski's rival school, which is North Carolina, and I have Elliot Cadeau. Now, 20 is, is considered pretty high for a small guard. Cadeau is only 6'1", 175. He's a freshman going to North Carolina. I've had a chance to watch him play in person a couple times. I saw him at Basketball Without Borders in Salt Lake City over All-Star Weekend. And then I saw him play this past summer. He played in the on the EYBL circuit. Now, Cadeau is, again, small guard. Now, the NBA has been very brutal to small guards. Sharif Cooper and Kennedy Chandler are two examples of freshman guards that were small and undersized, that had good seasons, that the NBA draft was unkind. Now, there are some exceptions. Um, Trey Young is an exception. And Darius Garland is an exception. But other than that, I mean, it's been pretty tough for small point guards to get a first round grade. And I think a lot of times teams are concerned about their defense and are they going to be getting picked on because they're small and they'd have to be dynamite on offense to make up for their lack of size and, you know, in a league where guys are switching. But Cadeau, now he fits the small guard description. And he's going to have plenty of people who probably think that he's too small to make an impact. But he is exciting. He is a, a, I mean, he's dynamic in transition. He has a quick first step. He's a sneaky good athlete. And when I say he's a sneaky good athlete, I'm talking about a guy that's, again, six foot one. Six foot one. And he had 12 dunks in the EYBL this season. 12 dunks for a, a point guard. And not all of his dunks were like in transition. I mean, he'll get in the lane. And once he gets to his launcher spot, he will go ahead and finish above the rim with a dunk, which is impressive. Again, we're not seeing a lot of 6-1 guards that are getting dunks in games. Now, Cadeau has blazing speed. He has a different gear or burst that allows him to get where he wants to go. And then defenders are kind of at his mercy because he has the handle, the shake and bake, and he is one of the best in this draft class at creating space off the dribble. 
and then he's a reliable shooter not a great shooter but he is a reliable shooter and he is a weapon at least on the eybl level he was a three level scorer but also a dynamite playmaker elliot cadeau i believe he could be a first round pick i have him at number 20. now the concerns are related to his size because north carolina will have a small backcourt with him and rj davis and i wonder how successful they'll be when you're playing basically two six one six two guards and then you look at duke duke is going to have bigger guards i mean tyrese proctor is is bigger than both and so they have some freshman guards that that are have a size advantage but anyway elliot cadeau i have at number 20. at number 19 i have another player that was at the basketball without borders camp that i went to all-star weekend and that is terry Darlin. Now, Terry or Darlan. Terry Darlan is a player that a lot of people aren't familiar with. He comes from the NBA Academy. He is from, I believe he's from Central Africa Republic. Now, a lot of times when you think of African prospects, you're thinking of a raw seven footer that protects the rim, block shots. But Darlan, is a wing and there are some people that believe he could actually end up developing into a point forward down the line 6 6 190 7 1 wingspan very fluid very coordinated has excellent pace to his game he's a good athlete but his game is not based off of athleticism at all it's just this very smooth I, i'm trying to think of the best way to describe it other than he has great pace he is again like i said a good athlete He's a promising shooter. He can attack closeouts. He's definitely not afraid of contact. He loves to drive to the rim in traffic and collect fouls. He gets fouls at a high rate. And he's someone that I think has a lot of promise as a pull-up shooter. So we're talking about a guy that's 6'6", with a long wingspan, that is a solid three-point shooter, can get to the rim, loves finishing through contact, and has shown a lot of promise as a pull-up shooter. Now the concern about Darlan is, is health, and I mentioned it in a previous podcast when I was at the Basketball Without Borders camp. I didn't see the injury. I was not too far from it. There was games going on in two courts, but I heard just the air come out of the room, and it was a pretty nasty injury. It was, a, I believe, like a complete dislocation. From what I heard, he has a knee surgery. They just kind of let it heal on his own, but it was kind of... Big, Paul George, USA basketball injury, something like that. But anyway, um, when I talked to him during summer league, he mentioned that he was close to being cleared. So again, that was early July. And so I've seen different videos of him working out, but if he ends up having a slow start, that wouldn't be surprising. I think he is someone that you're not gonna see many big games out of him you're gonna see just small doses of him early in the season but i think maybe around march or april that is when he'll start to get big minutes for the ignite and that is when i believe his draft stock will soar late in the season but at number 19 i have Terry dark line all right at number 18 now this is the biggest surprise on my mock i haven't seen many people have them on their mock it is Svi Messi from Baylor, 6'11", 225. I think he's going to catch a lot of people by surprise. I really do. He was a five-star recruit. He reclassified up. Even though he's going to be 20 on draft day, he's actually with his, I think he's with the right class. But he was playing behind. And there hasn't really been a lot of buzz around him because I think maybe before he decided to classify up, people thought he was maybe a guy for the 2025 draft. But from everything that I've been hearing, he has been excellent at Baylor in their scrimmages. I know Baylor had a, a pro week where they had their pros come back and play against the current guys. And I heard good things about him. I know he had a big game on Baylor's tour. Again, 6'11", 225 still raw but he plays hard great motor loves to dunk everything around the room you get him around the basket he's looking to power up and dunk everything again great motor i think he has the physical tools 
and the athleticism to be able to not only be a rim protector, but also be a reliable defender in pick and roll, someone that can keep guards in, in front of him for a couple dribbles. And I think that at the minimum, he'll be your, your vertical lob threat, rim finisher that anchors the defense and that can defend in space where he could end up really surprising people is his ability to put the ball on the floor in face-up situations, make, you know, a couple dribbles and attack the rim and finish. Now, he doesn't really space the floor yet, so that is not the biggest threat, but if he ends up getting a little bit more range around the basket, whether short corners, elbows, free throw lines, that is going to open up his game because he can put the ball on the floor and attack. It's a couple dribbles, not saying he's shifty, not saying that he's like, you know, a super skilled ball handler, but he does have it in him to, again, face up, attack, finish strong at the rim. I think he's going to be one of the best big men in the country because, again, his combination of size, length, and athleticism is it's rare, and he's fairly new to basketball. He's a late bloomer. So I think that his upside is, I think he has a very, very high upside, and I believe he could be the biggest surprise of the 2024 NBA draft. All right, when we return, I wanna talk about Jared McCain. Now McCain is in a unique situation going to Duke, but I wanna share my thoughts on McCain and basically this Duke guard rotation. But before then, I wanna to talk to you about Ibotta. Why Ibotta? Well, because you're already spending money so why not do it and get cash back? Whether it's picking up burgers or hot dogs for a summer barbecue, if you use Ibotta, you could get cash back. It is officially summer season. Well, summer is wrapping up, but it's officially still summer. Fall is coming up. And by fall coming up, you're going to need new clothes. But your closet shouldn't be the only thing growing when you're making purchases. Now you can also watch your cash back grow with each purchase when you use Ibotta. So if you're looking to take a vacation in the fall and you're dreading buying all the necessities before you take off, it is time to stop spending your hard-earned money without getting anything in return because there is Ibotta. Ibotta gives you cash back on hundreds of grocery items from produce to personal care to pantry goods. So you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you are purchasing. Either link your loyalty account or upload your receipt after you shop and you will get your cash back. It is that easy. The average Ibotta user earns $120 per year. Now that could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip, or you could use your cash back to buy that flight that you've been eyeing, that game you're dying to see, or that fancy dinner that you've been craving. Now I know there are other apps out there, but they give you points that don't amount to much at all. But with Ibotta, you can get real cash back that you can cash out to your bank account, PayPal, or your gift card. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 for trying Ibotta, but all you have to do is use the code LOCKED, L-O-C-K-E-D, when you register. Again, Ibotta. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Ibotta app and use the code LOCKED, L-O-C-K-E-D, that is I-B-O-T-T-A, in the Google Play or App Store, and use the code LOCKED you will get $5 just for trying it. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. Now be sure to check out the last episode where I gave my picks 21 through 30. And then don't forget the next episode where I'm going to round out my top 10 prospects. Find out who I believe is number one. All right, let's talk about Jared McCain. Jared McCain is a 6'3", 195-pound freshman guard who will be a freshman at Duke. McCain, from everything that I've heard, had an excellent summer playing in the different camps, and he is one of the better shooters and shot makers in this class. Now, I think that he has an interesting dilemma because Duke is returning their starting backcourt. Tyrese Proctor, who I believe is a top 10 pick, and then you have Jeremy Roach, who averaged like 13 points per game. So I imagine Duke is going to play small and they're going to have a three guard lineup. And the third guard spot is, I believe, is between Jared McCain or either Caleb Foster. I think McCain is going to win because I believe that he provides the best shooting gravity. 
whether it's shooting long range threes, whether it's shooting off the catch, shooting on the move, making contested pull up jumpers off the dribble. McCain is a dangerous scorer. He is, I think that he's more of a, a natural combo guard, but he does show enough passing instincts. I like his vision that he could be a point guard. Now, I think that it's gonna be interesting because Roach is point guard size, Proctor was best with the ball in his hands, and I believe McCain is also best with the ball in his hands. John Shire, you're gonna to have to figure things out. You're gonna to have to figure things out because you have a lot of talent and a lot of talent at the guard spot. But either way, I think Jerry McCain, if he's given the opportunity to put the ball in his hands, at least show glimpses of his potential as a passer. I think he is going to draw a lot of interest and that's why I have him at number 17. All right, at number 16, a surprise. I think I've seen one other person have him this high, but I think Garway Duol, I think he's gonna catch a lot of people by surprise. He is the epitome of a late bloomer. Two years ago, nobody ever heard of him. He wasn't even playing on like one of the, the major circuit teams He's from Houston, went to Indiana, kind of made a little bit of a name for himself. But now I think he's going to be one of the bigger surprises. He's someone that I've come to appreciate a lot more in the last couple of weeks. And I think he's going to be in the lottery discussions late in the season. He's 6'5", 190. He's smooth. He's athletic, long arms, good size for a point guard, shows pretty good court vision. And he has what I like in, in a point guard. And one of the things I really like in my lead ball handler, someone that can get in the paint. He's a walking paint touch. Once he gets in the lane, he can finish above the rim. He can make plays with, with soft touch finishes. And he has good enough vision to where he can collapse the defense and find open shooters. But the intrigue is his size, his length, his athleticism. I think he has the tools to be a, a really good defender. But I love the burst. What I would like to see from him is if he can show flashes as a shooter. Right now, he's so good at getting to the basket that I think that he's a reluctant shooter. And I think he has the tendency to pass up open shots for, contest, for contested shots in the lane. If he can continue to show flashes as a shooter and show growth as a playmaker, I think he could be around where I have him at, which is at number 16. All right, at number 15. It's a player that I've seen some people believe can go in the top five. Some people believe he can go as high as number one. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. Because I have some doubts and concerns, but I have him at number 15. And it is Ethan Almanza. He is playing for the G League Ignite. It's in a very interesting situation there. And I've talked about it at length. The Ignite have just an abundance of talent that I wonder how are they going to keep everyone happy and and get all their pieces to fit. But Ethan is 6'10", 215, arguably. And I don't know, I don't, I mean, maybe Luca, but I can't think of a player in recent memory that has a better international resume. He was the MVP of the U-17s, U-18s last summer, and then won MVP of the U-19s this summer. He has two gold medals and a silver medal in the last basically 13 months. He is just a, a, a great role player, I should say. Even though he's winning MVPs and he has this ridiculous trophy case, he is someone that I believe is the ideal role player. He is a, a guy that plays with great energy. He's a role man. He's a good athlete, not like a crazy great athlete, and it's one of those things where you can just kind of pick him apart and pick apart what he doesn't do well. He doesn't really space the floor. Like I said, a good athlete, not a great athlete, not like an elite rim protector, but you can't deny their production, especially when he's playing on the international side. Good motor, has good touch around the rim, a little bit unorthodox, but he has like soft touch floaters, like running hooks. But he is someone that I believe really, really benefits when he's playing overseas with the Spanish guards. Spain has several guards that are going to be professional players, whether they're NBA or not. I think they're going to be very high level European players. 
but they are very advanced decision makers and playmakers and ball movers. So they're able to hit him on the roll and find him in little crevices in the defense where he likes to score. I'm curious to see how he gets his points in the G League if he doesn't have that. And I think Dink Pate is a really good passer. I think Dink can find him. Ron Holland is a good passer for his position, more so of a ball mover, but he has good vision. Matas is a pretty good passer. So I wonder how Ethan is going to get his buckets in the G League. Now, there's a possibility that there's enough playmakers on the team that he can get easy buckets. And then there's also a possibility where he may struggle to, to score because he's not getting spoon-fed the easy buckets on the roll. I'll put it like this. He's probably one of the five players I am most interested in seeing how he performs this season. Because when you look at his numbers with the Ignite, they're nowhere near the numbers that he puts up when he's playing in Spain. Like, for example, his first year with the Ignite, he averaged 6.5 rebounds per game. This year, it went to 9.8 rebounds per game. So I'm curious to see, like, you know, when he's playing with the Spanish national team, is he someone that is just better in FIBA play than he is in the States, where it's a little bit more, it's not as free-flowing. I guess that's the best way, way I can put it. But I'm curious to see how he's used. I think his best position is as a five, but he's a little light, a little light in the pants to play the five, especially when you fi figure out or factor in that he's going to be playing against grown men in the G League. I don't know if he spaces the floor enough to be a four. So he's like a guy that is in between positions right now. Now, once he gets stronger, I think he is going to be a five. But right now, I feel like as a team, you may have to project down the line him being a five because I think he's really going to struggle at the five. But again, you can't deny the production, the motor. I think he's going to be someone that is going to have a long career as a, I don't think he's an all-star, but I think he is someone that could be a starter for 10 years or at least a high level starter. But that's why I have Ethan Amansa at number 15. All right, last segment at number 14, I have Cody Williams. Now, I've heard quite a few people talk about Cody Williams as being overrated. I've heard some people say that he is basically getting a bump up because he is the brother of Jalen Williams for the Oklahoma City Thunder. And Jalen is coming off a phenomenal rookie year. But I like Cody Williams. I think he's a lottery pick. I love the fact that he's 6'8", he's smooth, he can play in a variety of ways. He is someone that is, he's fluid and he's crafty, loves to score off the dribble. He likes to get downhill. And once he gets downhill, I think he's a very, very efficient finisher around the rim. And he's efficient because, again, he's crafty, has soft touch, not like super explosive or making a bunch of plays above the rim, but he just is very, very crafty with good touch around the rim. Now, he has the versatility to play multiple spots. I think that there, there is a world where he could play some minutes as like a point forward, but with his size and his skill set, I can see him playing some four down the line, three, two, one. So I love his versatility. And I think that he can defend all over the floor, but he can't shoot. Right now, he is not a good shooter. That is something that I'm going to be paying attention to is outside shooting. Now, if he really, really struggles as a shooter from the outside, then I think it's not all doom and gloom for him because you can put the ball in his hands and let him make plays as a playmaker. And I think if he's at 6'8", playing as like the, the point guard or the point forward, I think that can mask some of his lack of shooting on the college level. One of the biggest mysteries, I believe, in the 2024 NBA draft, he has a very wide range of where he could end up, and it is Kentucky freshman Zanamar Ivisic, 7'2", 220. Now, I really, really fell in love with this game after watching him at the under-20s this year. I am higher than, I'm higher on him than most. I'm really, really intrigued by his blend of size, coordination, and his skill set that you just don't find on guys that are seven foot plus. 
He moves like a wing. He can handle the ball a little bit. He shows some flashes as a shot creator. I mean, he had some tough step back threes, side step threes that he made at the under 20s. And he is someone that I think has real promise as a floor spacer, a shot maker, a transition ball handler, and as a defender. He's going to need to pick up a little weight. He's a little thin at 7'2", 220, but the skill set is there. He has very good touch in the post and footwork. The problem is he, you can push him out of his spots, which once he gets stronger, I think he has the real opportunity to be an inside-outside threat that can protect the rim. He's mobile and fluid enough to where I think he can be able to defend in space, but I'm really, really intrigued by his upside. He is, like I said, a great rim protector. I know he averaged like 3.4 blocks in, in, a, in a tournament. The concern is how he's going to fit in at Kentucky. Kentucky is four deep on their front line, which is crazy because maybe like six weeks ago, they barely even had seven roster players. So I'm interested in seeing how it works out with Aaron Bradshaw. They got um, Oyenso, who is due for a breakout sophomore year. Then they have Trey Mitchell, who is super experienced. I think this is like his third or fourth school. And so they have four bigs. And somebody's going to be the odd man out. And I don't even know, like, if I had to bet which one would be the odd man out, I couldn't even tell you because I can make a case for each one of those guys as why they should play and why they could possibly be the odd man out. There's a couple injuries. On Yenso had an injury that he suffered where he wasn't allowed to, or he wasn't able to play in the Global Jam. And same with Aaron Bradshaw. And I think that is the reason why they went and, and got Evisic from the international ranks. But I believe, talent-wise, he is one of the more skilled players in this class. If I had to make a comparison, I'd say he has a little bit of Porzingis in his game. But I think he's a lot more fluid than Porzingis. But the difference is, at the same age, Porzingis was playing in the ACB, which is the top domestic league outside of the NBA, while Ivisic had a cup of tea in a professional league, but it definitely wasn't the ACB. But best case scenario, I think he is Porzingis with a little bit more fluidity and ball handling and shot creativity upside. All right, at number 12, I have Jacoby Walter. Walter is going to be a freshman at Baylor. 6'5", 180. Walter is a player that I would not be surprised. It would not catch me off guard if he is someone that we're talking about being selected in the top half of the lottery come next June. He's skilled at 6'5". He is someone that I think at the very minimum, I think at the very minimum, he could be your 3 and D wing because he's 6'5 with a 6'10 wingspan has the athleticism and the mindset to be a, a good defender. But I think that's at the very minimum. I think if he puts it all together, he could be a three-level scorer because he is a creative scorer off the dribble, loves to get busy off the bounce. He can finish at the rim. He can make tough shots, whether it's contested step backs, pull-up jumpers off the dribble. He is a good shooter off the catch. He can shoot off the move. But what makes him really intriguing is at his size, is that he's a really good passer. He's a good passer. I don't know if he's necessarily like a primary ball handler. I mean, if I'm a team, I would definitely try and give him some minutes to see what he can do. But I think with his vision, he is someone that can thrive as a secondary playmaker, but also as a shot creator, shot maker off the dribble. So I'm really intrigued by his talent. I think Baylor is also pretty loaded in, in the backcourt. So it'll be interesting to see his role, considering that Baylor has a couple of high-level transfers that are coming in and expected to play. All right. And at number 11, a player that I'm really high on is Riley Kugel from Florida. 6'5", sophomore. I think that he should have went in the 2023 NBA draft. At least I would have selected him as a first-rounder in the 2023 NBA draft after averaging 17 points per game in his last 10 games, really took off once Colin Castleton was out and Florida gave him the keys to the offense. I feel like Florida didn't know what they had in Kugel. Now, 
based off of my big board 1.0 coming back to school helps this draft stock because I don't think he would have went number 11 in last year's draft, but I have him at number 11. And I believe that he's going to show and prove that he is one of the top 15 players in the country. He is freakishly athletic, one of the best athletes in this draft class, and he's a good shooter. He is a good shooter, whether it's shooting off the catch, whether it's contested, uncontested, shooting off the dribble. He is a guy that can knock down shots. He shot 38% from three last year. He's not a, you know, like your, your, your spot-up shooter. He can make shots as a spot-up shooter, but he's a guy that can get you a bucket at the end of the shot clock. And I love guys that, hey, we're in a tough situation. The defense has shut everything down. We need somebody that we can say clear out and go get us one. And Riley Kugel can do that. What I'm looking forward to seeing from him this year is can he improve as a decision maker and finisher at the rim? Despite being like really, really athletic, he only shot 48% on layups and he missed five, five dunks, which, you know, that's not a stat you always hear people talk about, but he missed five of his 22 dunks. So he can be a little wild when he's going to the rim. I like to see him play with a little more pace. If he can add a little bit more pace to his game and cut down on his turnovers because he had 48 turnovers and only 33 assists, I think he could be someone that could we, we could be talking about as a top 10 pick or even better because the tools are there, whether it's the shooting, the shot making, it's just a matter of him becoming a better finisher, kind of adding a little bit more pace to his game and becoming a better decision maker with the ball in his hands. Well, that wraps up this episode. Be sure to watch part one of the three-part series. This is part two. The first episode was, again, Prospects 21 through 30. And then the next episode, I'm going to give you my top 10 prospects for my big board. I keep wanting to say mock draft. I keep wanting to say mock draft. I'm going to give you the top 10 prospects for my big board 1.0. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow, and I am out. <laughs>